This podcast is part of the Sports Social Podcast Network. 1865, the Nottingham Forest podcast is proudly sponsored by The Terrace, the home of retro and fan culture sports merchandise. Check out their range of forest merch by visiting theterrastore.com or visit them on social media. The 1865 Match Report. Hello there and welcome to the 1865 Match Report and thank you for joining us. We are talking about Nottingham Forest recording a 2-0 victory at home against Bristol City. There were lots of chances and a very happy manager and fans at the end of it all. In a few minutes, we'll hear some uh, post-match considered opinions from Baz. Um, but first, the team news. And it's pretty simple. Uh, we had Philip Zinkenagel coming in for Ryan Yates, which meant that J- Jimmy Garner uh, dropped back into the midfield. So we had Horvath in goal, Worrell, Cook and McKenna across the back. Spence and Lowe at wing-backs, and then uh, Garner and Colback behind Zinconagel, who was supporting Brennan Johnson and Keenan Davis. Now, before we go to Baz, I spoke to a Bristol City fan, Matthew Withers, from the Three Peeps in a Pod podcast, and I asked Matthew if this was a fair result and what he made of the Reds. In terms of a fair result, no, it wasn't. Um, the win was a fair result, but it should have been five or six. Our keeper was our best player. We never got going. Um, Forrest were by far and away the better side. Davis was holding the ball up lovely. And, and Jed Spence, I think everyone in the country knows about Jed Spence at the moment. Um, he caused us all sorts of problems. So, yeah, thoroughly deserved victory for um, for Forrest. Um, we can't have any complaints. Um, I don't think there was anything really to talk about controversial there was a few bookings I thought the ref was fussy but um in truth I didn't think we we got close enough to you for there to be anything controversial um so no uh, as I say I don't think there was anything really to, to to sort of talk too much on that and in terms of forest chances um that's as good a performance as I've seen from a side this season so I think if you can keep all your players fit um and if Spence is in that sort of mood then I think you've got every chance in uh, and best of luck for the season Thank you to Matthew, first of all. And Baz, let's talk about the match because I think it's fair to say that, uh, as Matthew alluded to, Forrest got off to a blistering start, didn't they? Yeah. um, As many incidents in the first 10 minutes of the game as there were in the rest of the game put together, I think. Um, Started off with, uh, obviously, this is the first time I've seen Horvath in goal since the Middlesbrough thing that he Mm -hmm. did. Um, and right at the start of the game, Worrell sold him short with a back header uh, and Horvath looked incredibly nervous and fumbled at the ball. So we Do you think there was a bit of PTSD amongst the fans and the keeper? Yes, definitely. Uh, but we took it up the other end, fired the ball. I think it was Spence maybe fired the ball across the face of the goal. Mm-hmm. No one was there to get on the end of it. Um, Spence then had another shot from range. Um, Zink had a shot. Um there was a point where Zink got the ball in the middle of the park. Jono escaped his markers, and we're going to probably talk about that later, but Jono escaped his markers and there was this just inviting space for him to run into and Zink just didn't see it and didn't make the pass. Um, and then um, there was a booking which turned out to be quite important um, where their left back, he actually took out uh, Jimmy Garner, I think, um, and got booked for it. Yeah, so that early booking, I think you mentioned about Forrest really going for it. And what we've noticed in a few matches is that a lot of teams, Preston have done it, Cardiff did it recently. um, They've tried to stifle Forrest by firstly by pressing high against us, but also trying to double up on Spence and Johnson. So if your left back gets booked after nine minutes... That kind of sets the tone, would you say? <laughs> Absolutely. And you could see, especially Spence, he relished taking him on. He wanted to run at him and and he was doing all his little step overs and all that kind of stuff, saying, come on, just tackle me, tackle me. And the, the, obviously the, the left back couldn't do it. Mm-hmm. OK. On the subject of yellow cards, I'm just going to skip ahead a little while. After about, just after half an hour, uh, Brennan Johnson got a yellow card. And I think it was another incident involving Cameron Pring. Uh, that left back. Uh, right. Firstly, were you thinking that that was it for Pring? His afternoon was over. 
I didn't know it was him, and to be honest, the sun was in my eyes, so I didn't get a great view at it. Mm-hmm. But what I did see was Johnson was clear. Mm-hmm. I think he'd knocked the ball a little bit too far, mm-hmm. but there was no reason for him to go down. OK, so one thing that's worth clarifying, so fans at the match may not have realised this, but on the radio... Uh, Colin Frey confirmed that apparently the booking was for descent rather than for for a dive. Right, OK. So it, I don't know what the, inc- you know, the, I can't comment on the incident, but apparently the yellow card for Johnson was for descent because he protested a bit too vociferously. He was incensed, I have to say. And, okay. and as I say, I mean, the, the, I think I, as I saw it and as I say the sun was in my eyes I think he'd knocked the ball a bit too long but he he had the pace to get to it yeah. so there was no reason <laughs> that's for how it. he plays yeah, yeah. There's, there's no reason for it so for him to go down like that when he was very very close to the defender it suggested to me that he must have been tripped okay um the reason I skipped ahead to that so two reasons one is it I say we're talking about yellow cards and and Matthew did say that he thought the ref was fussy. I suspect there might be a few Forest fans who would agree with this as well. Mm -hmm. Um, But then the other thing is that there was this, it's a theme that we've seen a little bit more recently than we did do in Steve Cooper's first first few matches. Um, Let's talk about it because... Forrest had some big chances and Dan Bentley, who I think is a very good championship goalkeeper and a very good shot stopper, he made, I think, at least three big saves up to that point where um, where Johnson got booked. I think it was, I think, so there's uh, one from Davis. Um, well, well, talk us through some of those anyway. So, yeah, um, well, I've tried to try remember what they were. So, yeah, so there was... Um... Davis managed to do a pass to Jono mm-hmm. um, when it looked easier for Davis to score, mm-hmm. I have to say. And Jono hit it wide. Um, but before that, yeah, there was um, Spencer hit it from range. Zinc hit it hit it quite early on. And Steve, and Steve Cook tried one of his spectacular volleys. Oh, yeah. It, was, was it Cook? Yeah. <laughs> that, that makes it even better then. I, well, I, every so often I do just remind myself that... Um, I, I remember, I think Steve Cook... It might have been his first goal in the Premier League for Bournemouth was an overhead kick in the last minute, <laughs> I think. So um, he obviously fancies himself as a baller, doesn't yeah. he? But, um, yeah, I would say, I mean, Bentley kept them in the game completely. There, there was, yeah, three three nailed-on chances that took exceptional saves. Mm. If, if, if it had been Samba doing it, we would have been, say, we would have been praising him to high heaven. OK, so if you're a Bristol City fan, you're going to be really annoyed that before half-time... Spence linked up with Brennan Johnson, mm-hmm. and then in the end, I think Bentley will be very annoyed because it looked there may have been a deflection, but it looked quite soft. Talk us through the goal. So, um, yeah, so Spence picks a ball up in our half and then cuts inside because there's a bit of space in the middle of the park for some reason, mm-hmm. and then for whatever reason, it just opens up in front of him. Um, again, I think it was the, the left back again was tracking him, but mm-hmm. had to basically had to give up. And so Spence just keeps running and keeps running. So Jono peels off to the right-hand side. Um, Spence spots him. Uh, Jono's like at least 25 yards out, though, when he receives the ball. Runs in unchallenged because the left-back was out of position um, on a diagonal towards the near post mm-hmm. and then just hammers it. Mm-hmm. And it slides in to Bentley's uh, left-hand side between him and the, the, the near post. And... To be fair, yeah, you'd normally expect a keeper to have saved it. Uh, it sort of like slipped in behind behind him. It was like he was too okay. slow to react. So uh, for people who weren't at the match, let's try and com- find a point of comparison. So that, that Dwayne Holmes goal that, that Huddersfield scored at the city ground, was it similar to that where you kind of... You, you, it's a good shot, but you'd expect the keeper to save it? Yeah, you'd definitely expect the keeper to save it. Okie doke. So we get to half time. And one of the things that I thought was quite curious, uh, well, not curious, but maybe uh, uh, told told us something, is that uh, Bristol City made a substitution and they had a formation change, but the sacrificial lamb was Cameron Pring, the young left-back on a booking. Yep. Um, And, I mean, so right from the start, like you said before about teams trying to stifle us, 
Um, Bristol City didn't really do that. So right from the start, um, we were playing this really, really high tempo, short passing game. But when they did manage to get possession off us, they were doing the same thing back. Mm -hmm. Um, It was very, very fast, short passing, um, very exciting to watch. And also quite ragged in times because championship players don't have the best first touch in the world. Um, But in the second half, after their formation change, it killed the game dead. So they did it to improve themselves defensively Mm -hmm. and to stifle us. Mm -hmm. Um, But it also took them all their offensive threat out of the game. Which, bearing in mind that they've got players like Andy Vyman and Chris Martin, who are very good attacking players at championship level, that seems uh, a bit curious, doesn't it? But, I mean, neither Vyman nor Martin really made that much impression no. especially in the second half I mean I, don't, I, I can't really remember um, Bristol City making much in the entire game um, I, I don't think Horvath had a real save to make mm-hmm. um, but yeah the second half the tempo of it was much lower mm-hmm. and they had obviously decided if they don't do something about Spence and Johnson then they're going to lose 6-0 so, and so they, they, they basically rather than they had the choice of twist or stick yeah if we if we twist and keep going, then yes, we might be able to do some exciting attacking play and maybe we'll get a goal. But actually, there's also a chance we're yeah. going to get hammered. So yeah. they, they kind of oh, close yeah. the door. It's, it's like the option is 6-1 or 1-0. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, and, and you mentioned about, about Horvath. Uh, just a quick note that he was sent out to do the post-match interview uh, with the radio and understandably sounded pretty pleased with himself. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um... <sighs> There was a bit in the first half where, so they they noticed, like, as I said, right at the start, uh, I think Worrell's still injured, by the way. Mm -hmm. Um, He's not recovered from his broken ribs because there was a couple of times where he was just squatting on the floor, Mm -hmm. like like he was a bit out of breath. And a lot of his passes went short. And then right at the start, this header that he did back to Horvath went short. Mm -hmm. Um, And Horvath was was nervous Mm -hmm. and the Bristol City players noticed that Mm -hmm. and so they started trying to press him and so every time the ball we passed the ball back to him you could see Horvath hesitating before kicking and obviously Samba we're used to Samba Samba's brilliant with distribution Horvath isn't Mm -hmm. Horvath's very good seems to be very good at, at commanding his area and shot stopping but distribution isn't his thing there was one point where the the um City forward Semenyo. Yes, he tries to press Horvath on the ball. Horvath does a little trick and takes the ball and um, takes it past him. And you could see this, like, his, like, beaming that that he'd managed to do it. Well... And then the second Bristol City player comes up to him and he almost loses it mm. and just manages to clear it. Yeah, and of course, uh, it just shows, doesn't it? It's a dangerous game to play. That's one of the things that's changed in in modern football is that um, your keeper has to have ability with his feet, but essentially they are the last line, aren't they? So so as Horvath discovered to his cost in his previous, uh, previous run out... Um, you get it wrong and, and that's it. Now, we talked about that change that Bristol City made at halftime. Uh, I mean, it has to be said, it didn't take long before Forrest more or less put the game to bed. And uh, step forward, one of your favourite players, Mr Scott McKenna. Well, actually, no, so, so even better than that, we, I was just, I turned to the bloke next to me, I'd heard him say to his mate um, that Max Lowe was having a terrible game and I turned to him and said, I don't think Max Lowe's recovered from injury. Because if you look at him, he's just not run all game. And he goes, you know what? You're right. Just as we were saying that, Max Lowe makes this fantastic run. <laughs> 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 Appears on, uh, sort of on, the, on the left wing. Um, does a little cut in to, to McKenna. Um, and then the ball gets played across the face of goal, sort of on the edge of the D, to Jimmy Garner, who's running in from deep, and he just wellies it into the net. Well, what's interesting about that is, firstly, McKenna does that rampaging thing yeah. as, it, as if he was Stuart Pearce in his head, <laughs> yeah, yeah. even though he's not the left-back. And then, secondly, um, yeah, he had that interchange with Lowe. But when the ball went across the box, it was actually Lowe who looked up and realised he couldn't get a shot, especially on his right foot. So he poked it across so that Garner could do that. And and actually, when you look at it from behind the goal, Garner actually passed it into the net. So you say he wellied it, but it was actually quite precise. He knew yeah. what he wanted to do with it. And that's a good thing, isn't it? Because that's a sign 
that garners confidence, which we've known for some time, yeah. but it's also a sign the fact that, yeah, Lowe is finding his way back in. He's been, he's been relatively quiet, hasn't he? Yeah. But that's going to be good for him. It's good for McKenna that one of his runs forward has, has created something. And it was good for the team on the day because, I'll say, it more or less put the game to bed, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. After 55 um, minutes. Yeah. And I'd say, I've said this before, but I still think it holds true. With with Spence, Spence makes things happen, but Lowe makes goals happen. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I think Spence has still only got one assist and two goals. Yeah. Whereas Lowe, his, I mean, he's created so many goals, either directly or indirectly, hasn't yeah. he? His assists... Um, uh, ratio is pretty good, I think. Yeah. So, yeah, you're absolutely right. And, then, and, yeah, he's, he's, to... and he's got fabulous cross on him, probably better than Spence. Yeah, definitely. Um, just to add to, yeah, and uh, Scott McKenna was outstanding today. Um, if it hadn't been for probably Jed Spence and Jimmy Garner, he would have been man of the match for me. Because okay. and, and Jedmond was the one who got the official man of the match, wasn't he? Yeah. It? Yeah, OK. So, you know, let's just cut to the chase. Was this pretty comfortable afterwards? Was there only one team who was going to win it? Yeah, uh, I think from the first few minutes, <laughs> okay. there was, there was right. only one so team that was going to win it. <laughs> let's put it another way then. Um, should Forrest have, as Matthew mentioned, should Forrest have basically scored five or six? I mean, let's talk about Keenan Davis. Um, he's still a real handful, isn't he? But I think, what, not for the first time recently... He'll be disappointed not to have had a goal today. Yeah, I mean, his play was outstanding. Um, he spent most of the game with his back to goal, receiving the ball, holding off two defenders and then playing someone else into the game. Proper number nine stuff. Yeah, proper number nine. And uh, it was really, really good. But as I said, there was a point at one point where he had a shot on and I don't know if it's confidence or what, or but he gave it to Jono and Jono hit it wide when, mm-hmm. when he should have shot. A proper number nine would have shot there. Yeah, and of course, bearing in mind that, you know, Davis had that little run of, of getting three goals in however many yeah. matches. Um, and I think if if this match had come straight after that, he would have shot, wouldn't he? Yes, it? yeah, yeah. Yeah, OK. Um, again, just um, not for the first time, and especially thinking about the end of the Preston match. Now, uh, for those of you who listen to our... Preston match report with Stephen and Tom, they asked a question about Jed Spence creating that late chance, the run, the, the cross into the corridor of uncertainty. And I think today there were a few moments like that, weren't there? From Spence at least, and so on. At least and, two that I've got written down, one where Jimmy Garner puts it across the goal and there's no one running in. Yeah, and, and you mentioned the Spence one in the first yeah. half as well. And we haven't... We discussed, haven't we, that we haven't missed Lewis Graben as, as much as we thought, but those are Lewis Graben chances, aren't Absolutely, they? That's where you'd yeah. have a Lewis Graben just tapping him in. Yeah, yeah, and that's it's one of those that his skill is knowing where to be, the right place at the right time, and Davis doesn't have that same skill. Mm-hmm. OK. Um, Davis was replaced. He was the first sub off, as usually happens. Sam Surridge came on. Uh, second chance you've had to see him as a sub. What did you think? Today, I thought he didn't look capable at this level. He looked out of his depth. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if that's a lack of sharpness or fitness, because he hasn't really played much, has he? Um, but he looked like like a League One player at okay. this level. And I was thinking back to um, when we had a chat with uh, Ben from the YYY Files podcast, and he said that Surridge started really well at Stoke because he knew he was signed to be the number nine and he got an early goal on his debut and so on and so forth. Do you reckon it's a confidence and you reckon we'll see a different Surridge and maybe he'll be the man to be in, you know, on the six-yard line when the ball's placed into there Possibly. if he gets a goal? I, I, I think uh, if he gets a goal, yeah. I mean, again, the, yeah. I think he definitely needs a goal. I think probably he needs to start as well. I don't think he... Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't think his situation is whatever it is. He didn't look up to it today, um, and maybe coming on with ten minutes or fifteen minutes to go or whatever doesn't help with that. Okay, um, let's just think about the other subs. So the other subs that were made were on eighty-two minutes. Uh, Ryan Yates came on for Zinconagel, which presumably saw Jimmy Garner just move a little bit further forward. And uh, then, but Jimmy Garn was taken off well, five just minutes before, later before anyway. That, yeah, so um, so there was a point. Uh, Zink was sort of playing that that sort of number ten role behind the front two um, in the centre of the park, 
and he was often getting crowded out of it. And there was one point where he, uh, I mean, he's not an unphysical player, but he got out muscled quite a bit. And the bloke next to me was saying he's having a terrible game. I thought he had an okay game. Mm-hmm. But there was one point right to, just before he got taken off where he got shoved over and then the player ran past him and I think caught him with his boot in the head. And Zink was just lying on the floor, rolling around, and then the play carried on and then the referee noticed him lying on the floor afterwards. Um, and the bloke behind me then shouted, um, get up, you great big Dutch twat, to which everyone went, he's Danish. Yeah, <laughs> I was going to say, if you, you need to get your facts right, don't you? <laughs> which, um, which made us all laugh. And then Yates comes on, mm-hmm. and what really, really pleased me about uh, Yates coming on, apart from obviously he give us all the Ryan Yates stuff that we've come to know and love, mm-hmm. but the old um, Brian Rice song got resurrected by, yeah. by the Bridgeford. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so... So we made that change, and I'll say um, Jimmy Garner came off five minutes later, so yep. he, he didn't really get a chance to play as the number 10, um, and, and Cafu came on. One thing that w- I did notice was that all of those players did get a very warm reception, Davis, Zinconago, and Garner, when yep. they were brought off. Um, is that just a sign of the fact that the match went well, or is that also a reflection on their individual contributions, or a bit of both? I think um, Davis and Garner, uh, I mean, both of them... Um, as I say, the bloke next to me did, wasn't impressed with Zinc, <laughs> but I think I think he had a decent game. Whereas Davis and Garner both had outstanding games. And mm-hmm. Garner probably a little bit more than Davis, but everyone could see that the important hold up play that Davis was doing, and both of them were incredibly appreciated. And both got big standing ovations as yeah. they came off. And and presumably, as far as you can tell, we know that Steve Cooper's not made unnecessary substitutions in the past. And, of course, he, he took he took a few belters for not making more subs or making earlier subs as well uh, against Preston. But presumably this was about protecting that starting 11. Yeah, yeah. The match, so. was, the match was in the bag. Yeah, yeah. can protect the players. OK, so thank you very much, Baz. Um, one thing that I will just uh, reflect upon is the league table. As we noticed against uh, in, in the week, if you fail to pick up points, someone else will pick up those points around you. So it means that Forest do... It feels like we've lost ground a little bit. But the match coming up on Friday against Sheffield United, that's now a bit of a six-pointer. So there are still things... Um, you know, there's still a, a lot going on, a lot to play for. We're going to be recording a our monthly podcast, a uh, discussion um, podcast... This weekend, and that will be in your feed early in the week. And we will be discussing the league table. We will be discussing what Forest prospects are. So stick with us. And in the meantime, thanks to Baz and thanks to Matthew and thanks to you, listener.